of all, um, I want to thank MTV for responding so quickly to um, our request for a conversation. Um, and I think that it's uh, really important that I frame that um, that way. We are here today for um, a couple of reasons. One is uh, the UN is getting older, who knew? Uh, this year we're going to be 73 years old. Uh, so I know, happy birthday. <laughs> but um, because it's going to be um, another year, um, we thought it was also important to have a reflection. And if you start by looking at the fact that Uganda's relationship with the UN started literally right after independence, we thought it was good to make sure that as we approach October 24th, we have a more in-depth discussion with Ugandan people about what do they understand about our work and how can we change that. Um, so let me start off by explaining the uniqueness of the UN family um, in Uganda. My name is Rosa Malango. I'm the UN resident coordinator and UNDP resident representative for Uganda. Now, what that means is that, um, actually Uganda is unique. We have two types of UN presidents in, in Uganda. We have the UN country team, and the UN country team includes 18 agencies. Um, right now, I think what, uh, 1,600 um, staff working on peace building, humanitarian, and development. Um, and I'm really, really um, delighted that um, some of my colleagues are here today, and I'm going to ask them to stand for recognition, please. These are the leaders of the UN country team. Thank you. They helped me to carry this incredible load. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, but Uganda is also a regional hub. And what that means is that many of you have seen the base that we have in Entebbe. That base basically responds to the region and to the world when it comes to support to peace building operations, peace missions, and other activities along those lines. In that um, space, we have another 1,000 plus staff, um, and we do our best to coordinate between them and us. And I'm really, really excited that the newest member to the UN family in Uganda is the United Nations Federal Credit Union, which I fought to bring. So that means that Uganda is now the second country in Africa to have a UN bank, and it's only available in seven places in the world. So there we go. Um, out of the 2,000 plus staff that we have, it's very important to know 70% are Ugandan, actually. So whenever you're talking about the UN this and that, you're talking about your brothers and sisters. You know? So, um, and that's a very important, um, profile that we have and we're committed to keeping it um, as we go forward. Now, who does the UN work for um, in Uganda? The current estimate is that Uganda has close to 40 million people, give and take, out of which between 75 and 78 percent are below the age of 30, and I'm looking at UNFPA here. Um, we also have 1.4 million refugees, we have UNHCR in the room. So give and take, we're working for 42 million people in this country every single day. What guides the work that we do as a United Nations here? Two things. Our charter, the United Nations Charter, and the national vision, which in the case of Uganda is National Vision 2040. And right now, the National Development Plan 2, even though we're preparing for National Development Plan 3. Now, having two strategies, you need a common ground. And it's, I'm really, really excited that we're here discussing about our common ground. And the common ground between the government, the people of Uganda, and us as a UN system is what we call Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Another reason why this discussion is really important is that it took a couple of years for all the member states to agree to Agenda 2030. And for those of you who may not know, there is 193 member states of the United Nations. Now, you see what it takes to get the cabinet and the parliament to agree to anything here? Put that together 193 times and get them to agree on anything. And yet, we did. And what is even more important for you to recognize is that 
using diplomacy and outreach to get them to agree to common ground was actually led by Uganda. Uganda was the president of the General Assembly when the 193 member states agreed to have a common development agenda. So if you can get 193 member states to agree to have responsible development that respects people and puts the planet first, I have no doubt that you could, that same energy can be applied to implementing the national vision here. And that guides my optimism. Now, the full title of the agenda, just you know, for reference so we keep it, is it was called Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Transforming our world, not yours, not his, hers, ours. Another thing that's very important for everybody to know is that this is the first agenda for the UN that wasn't defined by technocrats. The 2030 agenda took several years to do because each country had a consultation, and then there was a regional consultation, and then other regions came together, and here, so it's a people, it's a bottom-up approach to development. And that is why, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, it applies to all countries. The MDGs were for developing countries, SDGs is for everyone. But it means you need to adapt it to your own reality. How can we measure progress on this shared agenda? Well, member states came up with 17 development goals. And once again, Uganda has led by doing two things at the global level. We were the first country to incorporate the SDGs into the National Development Plan and the UN Development Assistance Framework. The first, we have that. We were the first country on the planet to actually produce a book that linked the SDGs to your constitution, to your cultural values. Again, we've done that. Everybody has taken a copy. We were also the first to do these and have them published in local languages last year. And here I want to thank the NGO Forum for partnering with us to bring the NGOs closer to home to people. So we've done it in 10 local languages and counting in terms of bringing it out. We were also the first in Africa to try to figure out how to bring the private sector in. And this is where I'm very excited to see Patrick and the others because Uganda last year was the first African country to roll out what we call the gender seal. This had only been done in the world before in Latin America. And what the gender seal does is basically a commitment to make sure that you respect gender and the way you run your business and the way you provide services to your customers. So doing the right thing is still good business. We now have five African countries trying to learn from Uganda how to take this forward. Today is one about values and profit. I said and, not versus. How can we link our values and have a responsible approach to business in Uganda? Let me share with you the five P's that underpin the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. They are people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. And I challenge any of you to tell me that any of those five P's, you don't have them in your business strategy, in your mission statement. So imagine that 193 member states came together, said that we have to eliminate poverty, we have to be inclusive, we have to make sure that there's equality, and we have to do it by making sure we place people and planet at the center of all efforts to, to achieve inclusive prosperity, to sustain peace, through equitable partnerships. Doesn't it sound like a business plan? <laughs> I'm just saying, and I'm trying, I'm a bureaucrat. So now, imagine when we say partnering with you, and I'm saying partnership, I'm not saying funding. This is a reflection. We need you as partners. You are in the same areas that we are. You are dealing with the same people that we are. 
So how are you doing business in a way that makes sure that we don't leave anyone behind? I'm gonna focus for a second on the financial sector because I've seen some things traveling around which I think can help us in this regard. When I was first appointed by the Secretary General, my first trip was to Karamoja and Moroto. I saw two things there. One, I saw a group of young women living with HIV who were business, they were starting entrepreneurs, small association, trying to scale up, trying to figure it out. And then I saw a small group of young people who had been demobilized um, as a result of the war. They now were trying to do sewing of things and tourism and preventing domestic violence. When I asked the women what would they like, they wanted somebody to teach them how to have an account. They didn't ask me for millions of dollars. How can we have an account so that we can put our money here and buy and sell more and scale up. You know what the youth group told me that they wanted. When I asked them, what do you need to keep your activities going? And they were doing very important work. They were basically the 911 of the area. If they heard someone who was being battered or raped, they used to run to go and get the police to stop the violence. They asked me, Madam, can we have a bicycle? A bicycle. And can someone teach us how to make a hut because we kind of like want to teach each other how to read and write, and we're not sure. So, and since it's really hard, if we could figure that out, that's what they needed. The women, there are 500. The youth, 200. Imagine the repercussions for each one of them. If you estimate that maybe three, four people can benefit from any of them having a decent job. My discussion at that time with them and with the local government was why don't you bring these women together in a cooperative, take them together to the bank, and see if they can help them to get a product. So here we go. They were HIV. They're not being treated. We've given them some capital to have a different, decent livelihood. They know how to do business. They want to do business. Partnership. The youth that I met, I have to say, I bought so many things from those kids. On the margins, what they considered a hobby, they were sewing clothes and jewelry, and they were selling it across the border to Kenya at a disadvantage because it was not formalized. Again, we disarm them so that they don't take up weapons, they don't become combatants, they actually become productive members of their community. If you enable them to have a minimum capital to do that, imagine the repercussions, not just for Uganda, by the way, but Uganda and Kenya because it's a border community, it's the same people. Again, partnership. Let me give you another example that really impressed me. I was um, on Mission Barara, um, checking the old refugee case load in the host communities. And we were driving somewhere when someone told me, there's a young woman who has a factory of briquettes. OK, never seen a factory of briquettes. Let's go see it. Young Ugandan woman. 31, two, she had 15 employees. Out of the 15 employees, five were refugees, 10 were from the host communities. And she was making the briquettes, making the, the echo stoves, and she had signed up with some market women and a guy who had a bicycle to supply them. So they would come and get the briquettes and get the stove and sell it around the region and come back again. She was giving them jobs, but as a result of that, no violence in that district, no problems between refugees and host communities because they can have a job. They can pay for the kids to go to school. And guess what? They're making sure that you don't cut down on the forest so you're minimizing the environmental impact. You're promoting green growth. So here we go. We're talking green growth, green industrialization in an area where we're talking oil and we're talking ecotourism. Once again, partnership. I haven't asked you for a dime yet. I'm coming. Yes. But I'm having this conversation because this is what I'm saying when I talk about you as a partners and SDGs, is as a partners because investing in these people and their different needs is actually good business. 
One of the important things that we did last year was the Solidarity Summit for Refugees in Uganda. Now, let me tell you three reasons why that summit was really important. Normally as the UN, when we have those kind of things, we have it at our headquarters. I insisted on having it here because I wanted people to come and mingle and witness and see. We pulled that off with a lot of pain, but we did in a couple of months. Nothing is stopping you from keeping it going. The Ugandan approach to refugees remains a role model globally. And it is because of dignity, period. You provide a dignified approach to people who need it. You allow them to have jobs and go to school. So the day that they need to go back to the country as human beings, they will go. And you demonstrate that they're not a threat to national security, they're not a threat to your identity at all. They actually enrich the nation and the economy while they're here. That's the story. We did the first one. Why aren't you doing the second or the third? Take it, run with it. During that summit, the second thing that was really important, we did something that we had never done before. I asked my UNDP team to do for me investment profiles of each district hosting refugees. Now, as the UN, we normally have our humanitarian appeals. We roll them out. They're out there. But I thought, if we need to get investment, we need a different kind of document. So we worked with the Uganda, Uganda Investment Authority to come up with the profiles. And you look at them, and they talk to you about the potential for investment, whether it's minerals or something else in each district. Guess what? People have come in bilaterally now into the district to invest. And if you improve the economic uh, dynamics in those districts, for the host communities, the refugees will also benefit. Win-win. The information is there. We had a very good side event in the private sector. I haven't heard anything else. I'm putting it out there. Third one that also came out very strongly doing uh, the summit was African solidarity and I would say global solidarity. The testimonies we heard from the refugees was heart-wrenching to everyone. Everyone was there saying thank you. And you had the president of Somalia, look at the condition which Somalia is making a contribution as a way of saying thank you Uganda. The human spirit is amazing when you make the right pitch. Where has that solidarity gone? Now we are, we are talking about trying to deal with the numbers of HIV. We're talking about trying to keep girls in school because of the high pregnancy levels. We're having a debate about sexual education, like really? We want the kids to stay in school so they can become the best possible wives and husbands in the future. This is not a point for conversation. That's what it is. So can we please make it happen? It's about respect, it's about dignity, and more importantly, it's about solidarity. This is what it is. There is another initiative that we have done that I want to share with you before I go to my call to action and end this conversation. One of the things that really impressed me when I came to Uganda um, was how strong is your cultural identity. It's amazing. I'm from Central Africa and we're way lazy on that. It's very strong. And I kept thinking to myself, but then how can we leverage that to make sure that there is inclusiveness in the way the humanitarian development work takes place? And I was really excited. Almost all my colleagues had different um, engagements with different kingdoms and chiefdoms. So I brought together about seven of them. And I challenged them to identify for me common values across kingdoms and chiefdoms in Uganda. Do you want to guess how many they found? Anyone want to guess? How many? 70. Seven zero common values across these kingdoms and chiefdoms. So then I asked them to link them to the SDGs, and they linked every single one. So now we have a program called Ubuntu Mulamu, a local values appraised to SDGs. We're now I'm asking them, OK, now that we've identified these values, help me come up with a curricula so that you, these are the values we're teaching our youth. Because every single culture has a rite of passage 
what do you teach those youth during the rites of passage? We have to teach them to protect the environment. We have to teach them to work for themselves. We have to teach them to have an entrepreneurial spirit. We have to teach them to be safe so they can be healthy. How do we do that? Based on our values, nobody else's. Because this is a local value of global relevance. So as I close, a call to action, and my colleagues know that I always do this, I always leave a few calls to action for us to think about. You were introduced to Patrick, who is an SDG ambassador. I'm gonna challenge every single one of you here today to think about how to become a champion for one of the SDGs. And by being a champion for one, you're a champion for all. So how are you gonna be a champion, an ambassador for the SDGs at your workplace and within your community of influence. To the companies in this room and those who haven't made it yet, if you haven't signed, signed up to the gender seal, I seriously encourage you to do it before Christmas. It will be a nice way of ending the year, showing your commitment to gender. I want us also to consider investing in the inter-university quiz competition that NTV talked about. We can't always talk about the youth. We need to talk with them. And I really think that this inter-university quiz competition that they're going to do for the UN month is just one opportunity to have a constructive conversation. So I really invite all of you here in the room to consider supporting that financially. UN Day is October 24th. October itself is UN month because we're going to do awareness throughout. This year, the theme for the UN Day is a focus on SDG 3, good health and well-being. We figured if you're not healthy, you can't do anything else, pretty much. So please think about how you can join us and how you're going to promote good health and well-being. Last year, the youth asked us to change our hashtag from UN for you to UN is us. So today, I want to formally acknowledge that that is now our new hashtag by popular demand. It is UN is us, and we will be launching that this October. So again, to the private sector, I invite you to think about what you want to do. The hashtag is yours. The UN is all of us here today. Please read the UN Charter and remember, 70-something years ago, the United Nations was created because the world had been through the most incredible wars it had ever seen. And the number one promise at the top is to save future generations from the scourge as war. So as we sit here in this very nice environment this morning having this, bre this breakfast, I want us to also think, what are we going to do to make sure that this country does not generate in that direction? It is time to have a conversation about solutions that goes across generations, it goes across public and private sector. As the UN will be here to support you and accompany you as needed. But our commitment remains, first and foremost, to save future generations from the scourge of war. So with those words, I want to thank you once again for coming and to say I look forward to a, a lively conversation. And I hope that at the end of this breakfast, you will be SDG champions and I look forward to seeing your products promoting the SDGs and promoting the well-being and productivity of Uganda, not just in Uganda.